Hey guys, this is Lewis. Welcome back to Stove Day Problems. So on uh, today's episode, um, I kind of wanted to go ahead and do like a two-part series on the book that I'm currently um, currently reading upon, which is <clears throat> the history of the Peloponnesian War, written by two cities. He was he was a general for Athens during the whole course of this uh, war. He did die during before the war gave out or whatever but he was a historian and then who was it Xenophon yeah Xenophon which is the guy that, that uh finished off the uh, the Peloponnesian War because this is a quite long war I'm in the eighth I'm in the eighth year coming up right now no tenth year tenth year um, so the reason why I wanted the reason I wanted to speak about this book is because uh this is probably the first real history like a real like the first real narrative of history or real a real you know not romanticized not politicized not biased or anything like that and this is real shit and this is what he wanted to do to see like he knew he was going to get a lot of backlash because of the by, by his contemporaries and so on because he wasn't going to be biased like just because he was a general in Athens doesn't mean he was going to paint a bleak picture uh, or uh, or just completely villainize the Peloponnesian side, which is you know, the Lacedaemonians, also known as the Spartans and the Corinthians and, and the Thebans and all this other shit. Like, he wasn't going to do that. It was going to be as objective as could be possibly done during the, during that era. And... And it, it it had huge ramifications. Like you know, this is the, this book is thousands of years old, and it's probably one of the greatest history books I've ever read. You know, and how comprehensive it is, um, how in depth, how nasty it gets, bro. Like um, the shit that you read is, is is like sometimes I'm taken aback with with the shit that goes on in the book. So now to give some sort of context, I'm not a I know my classical history. I love classical history. That's why I felt like it was a need to read this book. Um, I love my ancient Greek, ancient Roman, and the Peloponnesian War set the stage for a lot of shit going on later on. Um, so it starts all basically like uh, I think I think it's uh, about fifty years after the Persian invasion. You know, the whole movie with the three hundred and the Spartans and all that shit. Yeah, during that era. Um, yeah, so it's basically 50 years after all that. Um, it all started with, you know, a, a fear of Athens. Because after the Medians, M Medians, which is what they call Persians in this book, uh, Athens really started becoming a superpower, a, Mediter a, a sea superpower, which is what you needed to be in the Mediterranean during that time. If you didn't have a great fleet, you really weren't going to be able to... Uh, we really were going to have a great economy. So they re like so during that time span of them beating them in in, in the whole Thermopylae thing and uh, what is it uh, Semotles uh, these fucking names uh, they confuse the shit out of me a uh, sea battle with uh, with Themistocles Themistocles like were really famous Athenian general they give like you know he was the one that was given a lot of the credit for beating back uh, the Persians. So during that transition of them winning those two battles and beating back the Persians, Athens really started gaining a lot of territory and becoming the head, the hegemon of the Hellenes, which is Greece. Uh, they really started having control. They made this whole confederation that people had to give taxes. Like they started getting all our allies. They started getting money from them and manpower and money for shipbuilding, money for their navy, money for their cities, money for all of this shit. So they really started coming up on their own, like uh, Athens, Attica, whatever. So the Peloponnesian War was really uh, um, fear from the Lacedaemonians also, which are called the Spartans. Like this is the first book where I really, the first time I hear the Spartans being called another name, no, another name, sorry. They don't even call them Spartans in this book. They call them Lacedaemonians. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, it took me like a, a minute to fucking realize who the hell they were talking about. And, which is quite interesting. Um, 
it, it was a fear because even you know the Peloponnese always had their own little sector and then you had the, uh, you know you had the uh, Arcananians and a whole bunch of fucking people I'm not gonna go through all those goddamn names a whole lot of fucking cities bro a whole lot of cities that sound a whole fucking like they sound almost a fucking same for a few letters like it's it, I, 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 I get confused sometimes and it, was, and it was a war against Athens because even Athens started taking over places in the Peloponnese within the sphere of, in, it, within the sphere of interest of Lacedaemon. Lacedem um, you know, within the, the Spartan sphere of interest or influence or whatever the case may be because uh, during that whole time span against the Persians, Spartans got a whole bad rap with their command. You know, people started becoming afraid of the Spartans. Because they were acting less like military commanders and more like dictators, you know, very harsh, very cruel. Uh, they lived by by codes that no one else fucking lived through, lived by or wanted to live by, you know. Um, Paul Zanius, which was a commander of the Lacedaemonians during that time period of the trend, like be, beating back the Persians and so on and so forth, very harsh individual, and he was he was even <coughs> a. Um, uh, accused of medism or you know being sympathetic to the Persians you know he started dressing very fine boy and he had a Persian court he was making it pretty fucking obvious that he was on the Persian payroll like I don't know people are idiots they get ambitious and it does never change so people started getting scared of them and they really gave that that's what I'm saying they really gave Athens the the key the the the, the baton like okay you lead the way and and it it just really shows how one day you could be friends and the next day you could be other enemies or vice versa. Because when the Peloponnesian War started out, there was a clear divide, I guess you could say. It all started between Corinth and Corsaria against uh, Epidamus, and then they've turned into a whole cascade of events that people are trying to get allies with Athens and like, oh, don't be your preacher. Like, I'm not gonna go deep dive into it because this is just gonna take way too fucking long. Uh, but there was a still fear mongering going on. Like a lot, a lot of cities were already trepidatious about the reach that Athens was able to extend to, by the power of mines or the by the power of taxes or, or getting tributes, as they called it. Because while everyone was giving tribute to Athens, that meant Athens was become military dominant, economically dominant. And yet these guys weren't doing anything. You know, you need practice in war in order to be good at it. And they weren't doing it. But I was talking about that because during this whole course of the Peloponnesian War, people revolt. People were revolting against Athens because they're like, oh, these guys are losing. We're going to get the fuck out of there. And we're going to go with Lacedaemon because they might win. And, and, you know, like, it really shows that, like, people, friendships, alliances... Um, fellowships, things of that nature, go like the wind, and that never changes. That always, that you know, there's throughout the entire course of human history, there's a constant, there's constant examples of those sort of events transpiring. That that, that sort of communication or that sort of severance of communication, that sort of turning the tide. Like I'm betraying this person for this person, and this person for this person, and it really shows here. And it really shows the pressure that war has on people um, in a manner that I was never able to, like, you don't really find in a lot of history books. You don't really find the opportunism that lays in the heart of people and that lays in the heart of people with power or without when war is, it, when war is in the air, when war is all around you. Because chaos does breed a whole lot of opportunity. And it just shows how turbulent we people, we are. You know, and war is an example, an example or personification of that aspect of our human consciousness. You know, uh, loyalty and all this shit is bullshit. You know, we're very opportunists. Loyalty is something that's very difficult to get, you know, to maintain when shit is not going right for you. Because when Athens was starting to lose in the beginning of the war, you know, like the Peloponnesians really had the land power, the military might to take them on. The only thing that Athens had for them was their navy. No one matched their navy. People really started revolting. You know, especially after uh, 
what's this fucking guy? Pericles, sorry. Pericles was like, okay, we're not going to go against them in the field because we're going to get our asses whooped. Let's just stay inside and, and beat them with our navy. And people really started taking advantage of the situation and started revolting. Like, like you know, Potidea, you had fucking other na and other cities, Mende, um, Sion, like a whole bunch of fucking, you know, names and cities that you probably don't know and I didn't know until I read the book. Uh, but then during the war, like around the fifth or sixth year, shit started turn turning against the Peloponnesians. It had them started getting a whole lot of wins. They just started ravaging a whole lot of territory on their side. And people started revolting. The last of them was even scared that their own slaves, which were called helots, were going to do another uprising, taking advantage of the situation. And it, the highlight of this shit is, is tremendous. You know, um, the like how it highlights this sort of thing. It, it's uh, it's something that's uh, that's rarely mimicked. This history book holds its own for, and it's been around for a very long time. And I felt like it's worth to mention because it really did set the stage for all these other history books that I've read, the ones I have behind me, and the ones I've yet to read. Uh, objective and unbiased and even they don't touch the way this does because one of the episodes that really shook me to the core was revolution of Corsiria or Corsira or I don't know how to which is one of the first allies but like I said that that city and Corinth their la their clash against each other basically set the stage for this Peloponnesian war and there was a revolution going on you know, there's two sides, like, we're all, like, there's a side against Athens saying, oh, we're being used by Athens, and we're going to get crushed, and this, this, and that, we're allowing them to use us, we have to side with the Spartans, with the Peloponnesians, and then the other side, like, no, we got to side with Athens, we got to side, we got to do this and that, and there was all revolution going on, and the Lacedaemonians were taking full advantage of the situation, and, and Athens came in and there was whole madness going on, like a whole madness. When it looked like the Spartans were gonna win, the the oligarchs, the higher ups, obviously are gonna be side of the Lacedaemonians because the Lacedaemonians only placed oligarchies in every single fucking town that they ran. And the commons were with Athens because you know Athens is a whole democracy and that's where democracy basically came from, blah 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 blah. So when the Lacedaemonians right in that city looked like they were going to take over because they won a, a sea battle right outside the city against Athens. There a, a fucking people started getting murdered and killed like crazy. But then when they ran away against Athens because Athens came back with reinforcements, those people started butchering the people outside of the Spartans like crazy. Butchering them, they fucking trapped them in a building. They were taken down by twenties and a whole row of people. And anybody that had problems with any of them would just stab them and beat them and throw rocks and beat the shit out of them while they were walking. And it, it fucking shows, like, and the way he describes it, that people really like during those turbulent times, during those chaotic times, people become very opportunistic. People don't care about family. People don't care about anything like that. People care about party. People, you know, are gonna side with those that are extreme like them that want to take advantage of the, the take advantage of the situation that's at hand. And it shows the brutality of human nature. You know, um, it reminds me a lot of 1917, the Russian Revolution, <laughs> um, the utter brutality. You know how people say that I'm doing this for this nation or this or that, like it's a whole bunch of excuses when at the end of the day, it's not like that. It's all for advancement. It's all for personal advancement. And it just highlights how human nature really doesn't change. Our environment may change, our technology may change, but we don't. We seem to not change. You know, it's a uh, startling not surprising, but it's still startling that you could find similarities with the people that came before you thousands of years ago, you know. Um, the fact that I could find similarities between this and the Russian Revolution in 1917, you know, that, that's over a thousand, that's over 2,000 years span between those two events. 
and it just shows how people were murdering each other and and you know the more extreme you acted the more manly you were and, and you had to be as audacious as possible you had to be as extreme as possible you had to be as emotional as possible because if you showed any sort of trepidation if you showed any hesitation you were considered weak so extreme feelings and extreme actions were normal were something that you needed to do because these were extreme times these are not normal times when it's normal, everything is cool. Everyone's sedated. But when there's war going on, everything goes off the fucking books. Like, they caught their blanche for everything. And, you know, that it, it, it it's it's a wonderful, scary, but it's a, a, a magnificent way of how this man portrays human nature throughout the entire course of the Peloponnesian War. You know, how the... How people are always winning to see, like, oh, who's on the winning side? Who's on the winning side? Who's on the winning side? And that's heavily personified as well by Perdiccas, which is a king of the, the Macedonians during that time. That guy is for Lacedaemon and then Sparta. I mean, and then Athens. And then going, goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The whole time he's going back and forth. He's still going back and forth right now where I'm reading. And we're about to hit the 10th year. Like, they're, right now they just signed armstress for a whole year. Everyone could relax. A whole lot of ravages going on. A whole lot of shit going on. Both of them are getting really tired. Both sides are tired. Both sides just want this to end as, as uh, obviously with advantages, and they want to be, they don't want to be on the back foot. They want this as to be as comprehensive and as, as advantageous for their side as possible, opportunity, you know. Um, but um, they're tired. War ravages. War kills. War causes revolutions. War causes massacres and famines and disease and. And the way, like, I just can't say enough great about this book. Like, y'all gotta read this shit. Um, it really does set the stage for international relations and geopolitics and things of that nature. Things I've always been extremely interested in. And this book set the stage for all that. And to this day, now, I've not really read a whole lot of books that even get on the same level as this one. Um, I can't wait to finish reading it. You know, it takes time. Like, with these books quality over quantity i'm gonna be honest with you i don't read 50 pages a day because my brain just can't handle it it's a whole lot of information but uh just wanted to speak about that it's i i i i'm really taken aback sometimes about the fucking crap that you read bro how you know people lay siege to a city and as soon as the gates start opening they fucking kill everybody put everyone to the sword you know how many fucking towns i've already read that people get wiped out potidea a city there wiped out the face of the earth no, no, not put it that Platea. See how similar these fucking names are? Platea. Wiped out the face of the earth when they got broken by the sea by the Lacedaemonians and the Thebans. Wiped out. It's fucking crazy. And how people always want to kill each other. So fucking ridiculous how people just want to kill each other all the time. <laughs> oh, shit. So, thank you guys for watching. I'm going to do a second part once I finish this book. Um... I got a little, I got, I got, I got, a, I got a bit left. I'm going to be honest with you. I got a bit left. I got to take a little by little, but um, it is what it is. Just want to really just talk about this book. This book is extremely important. If you're a history person, if you really do like your history, read about this shit or watch a documentary about the Peloponnesian War. It's extremely interesting, extremely exciting. And, you know, Athens and the whole dynamic between Sparta and Athens is being portrayed in movies. And it's an absolutely essential component of history. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we take for granted nowadays started here, started during that time period, uh, you know, democracy and voting and, 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 and nationalism and things of that nature really started taking hold here, you know, so, uh, thank you guys, uh, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, um, thank you guys all for the support recently and stuff like that, um, definitely also going to be keep putting out workout videos because those are fun as fuck too you know i like both both of these things you know history and working out so might as well be doing both obviously you know hopefully you get inspired to do one or the other or um, hopefully both because you got to get your knowledge up don't just be big and look like a fucking gym rat get your knowledge up people that's honestly far more important than be big as fuck so till next time guys peace